Welcome, Sandy. How are you doing? I'm very well. Thanks for having me, Chloe. Thank you so much for joining me. Can you share with us, for people that maybe don't know you and what you do, um, what it is that you do and how you got to where you are today? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I, what I do is I'm a monk, meditation teacher, um, author. I've written 12 books. Um, I am the creator of Calmology, uh, which is a combination of four primary uh, techniques, uh, two meditation techniques called Mind Calm and Body Calm, and then two kind of one-on-one -on -one mentoring therapy kind of techniques, which is Mind Detox and Calm Cure. So together they're known as Calmology. And I have an academy where I teach practitioners in either Mind Detox or Mind Calm Meditation or Calmologist, which is like a 24 month kind of big course that really um, has a big impact. So uh, that's kind of what I do. I'm a specialist in the mind-body connection and exploring the undercover root causes of health conditions, emotional issues, life issues. So in short, if something negative is happening in your body, emotions or life and you don't know why, then I, I do enjoy um, and have a bit of a special specialism uh, at being able to able to explore uh, what's going on behind the scenes. So we stop treating symptoms and we actually heal the hidden cause. So um, a, a range of different things, but ultimately it's about peace, healing and, and living consciously. Amazing, amazing. And, and how did you come to do this work? Are you one of these people that is I don't know, were you born calm? Were you born this way? <laughs> or did you, did you have to learn how to be a calmer person? Uh, far from it. I think we, we end up teaching what we, what we need to learn the most. Um, I think I heard you say that on Instagram recently, actually, now that I think say that. But uh, yeah, it's, um, I could be lonely in a room full of people. I had chronic anxiety. I had an eating disorder. I struggled with dyslexia. Um, I just felt a foreigner born into this world and didn't without a rule book or um, a user manual for <laughs> for my mind, my emotions, my body, and, and ultimately my life. Um, I always had a sense that there was more to life than the normal nine to five. Um, that uh, you know, nine to five, two point four kids, uh, picket fence, all that kind of classic. It's a cliche, I'm almost saying that now, but I generally have always felt there was more to life. So even when I got all this stuff I thought I wanted at a relatively young age, you know, I was on TV in 30 countries, I had best-selling books out, I'd fully booked everything, um, you know, clinics, retreats or whatever. Um, despite everything going so well, I, I was lacking fulfillment. And when I, um, about 12 years ago, someone came to me and said, look, Sandy, you look a bit tired and angry and pissed off at life and you're aging super fast. Uh, um, I love you, but you need to probably, you know, sort this out, you know. Um, and they said, have you tried meditation? And I was like, oh, I can't meditate. And they said, how do you know you can't meditate? And it was one of, it was a question, simple question, but it changed my life because I kind of sat back and went, how do I know I can't meditate? And I, I responded that I couldn't stop my mind. And they kind of laughed at me and said, you don't have to stop your mind to experience peace when meditating. Totally confused but curious, I went along to learn to meditate. Um, learned from a bunch of amazing, happy monks. They're actually annoyingly happy at the time because it felt so far from <laughs> uh, where I could be. And I actually ended up going off and meditating and, and learning from these monks uh, for six months residentially in, in the beginning. I meditating 18 hours a day, diving into meditation. Um, and came out the other end a uh, monk and meditation teacher. And since then, I've been combining, you know, the meditation with, you know, therapy techniques and things like that um, to really help people harness the power of peace in their life. Amazing. Amazing. Just, just out of curiosity, what, what makes someone a monk? What is the kind of, def is there a definition for that? Or? It's a great question. Um, well, I've dedicated my life to uh, bringing more peace to the planet. Um, I have a spiritual teacher who I've taken vows to. Um, now, it's not really the man I've taken vows to, although he's part of it. It's more uh, uh, a way of being. Um, in these uh, vows, I committed to exploring and mastering things like ahimsa, which is nonviolence, uh, satya, truthfulness, 
uh, brahmacharya, you know, self-restraint, and, and other other vows, uh, other other kind of. It's almost like a code of conduct, almost. But it's all about an inner relationship with life. It's an inner code. It's about you know, when I first heard about nonviolence, I was like, well, I'm not a violent person. I don't really need that vow. You know, I'm. I was the one that was bullied all the way through school. I'm I'm the peacemaker. You know. But the more I explored it, I realized I'd been in a battle most of my life. It was an inner battle. I was very self-violent. I was very hard on myself. I was very critical. I was very trying to be someone other than who I am already all the time. I was fighting my feelings, fighting my mind, wishing I had a different body. All these subtle things that I, through just exploring, for example, that one you know, useful boundary of aiming to be non-violent, ahimsa, um, it's shown me so, so much. Does that make sense? So yeah, yeah. certain kind of, a kind of a code of conduct almost that I'm choosing to do my best to, to live by in, in this lifetime. Uh, and I find it to be really powerful at helping to help me to, to wake up and experience the truth of myself and the truth of reality. So um, not, it's monk, being a monk isn't for everyone. You know, um, I just wanted and continue to want to take my spiritual journey to, to as far as I possibly can and to discover as much as I possibly can. I think that's amazing. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because everyone probably, well, the majority of people say that they would like, you know, peace on earth. And yet we can't even be peaceful in our own minds a lot of the time. Um, and I love what you said about, you know, saying in the beginning, oh, I can't meditate. And that's something that so many people say. I know that I said that for about 10 years or so before I finally, mm. finally clicked for me. Um, but so many people hold themselves back from meditating because of this belief that you need to clear your mind, that you need to be good at, you know, blocking out your thoughts. Um, and you actually teach meditation then. So you teach that on your, your courses and your retreats. Um, when I wrote you know, Mind Calm, I had a very long conversation with my publisher. It's like Mind Calm is here. I don't know if anyone's going to ever see this, if it's just an audio recording, but I'm holding up the book. Oh, yeah. Um, Lovely book. And um, I had a very long conversation with the guys at, at Hay House because I was adamant that I wanted the tagline to be the modern day meditation thing that gives, that gives you peace with mind. Because it was so fundamental to kind of the, the, the technique itself, but also the message that I'm trying to uh, convey with that meditation, which is, look, it's, not, it's never about the quantity or quality of your thoughts. It's never about how many thoughts you're having or how positive or negative or how bright or dark the thoughts are when it comes to peace, fulfillment, happiness, fearless living. It's about our relationship with our thoughts. It's 100% about our relationship with them. Um, yes, you can do stuff to change your thoughts, but the average person has 100,000 thoughts a day, supposedly, as far as Stanford uh, said when they did some research into it. Um, that's a lot of thoughts to change, even if only half of them are negative. Even if a tenth of them are negative, you're gonna have to <laughs> there's a lot of thoughts to try to change if you're only going to have positive thoughts. Thankfully, it's simply about changing your relationship with your thoughts, changing relationship with your mind having a healthy relationship with your mind, learning how to tune into what's useful and ignore the rest, very much like a radio on in the background. Um, you can listen to the good news or the nice song and then just turn out the bad news or whatever. And, and having a healthy relationship with your mind really is, is very liberating and it's the key to, to peace. Yeah, I think that's, that's so true. I think from the meditation that I've done over the years, it's not that I don't still get critical, like, you know, self-critical thoughts, but I can just ignore them more easily and let them go more easily. Um, it's not about never having a negative thought. Um, what sort of things, what sort of issues do people come to you with if they come on your retreat so they, you know, work with you in, in some way? Well, they kind of fall under three main categories. The first is um, health conditions. Uh, because I'm known as being, you know, able to help people to explore and discover the, the underlying mind-based causes of conditions. Um, a lot of people have read my books where I have directories of the mind-based causes or I've got techniques where I'm explaining, you know, how my techniques have helped other people um, heal the underlying cause. Um, you know, just today I, I was on Instagram and I, I, well, my assistant told me to go on Instagram to say, look, 
one of your ophthalmologist uh, graduates has just shared a before and after. And, and the image is her covered in eczema. And then after no eczema and her whole post is about, I didn't do this with a lotion or a potion or a pill. I did it by healing the mind-based cause using, using chemology. And I was like, whoa, you know? So when these sort of stories get out there, um, it is common for people to actually go, well, I've got this chronic condition. Why? You know, what, not, not why is this happening to me, but why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to my body? How might my body be uh, communicating what's going on in my life? If this physical condition was an emotion, what emotion would it be? If, if my body was trying to send me a message, what might it be trying to tell me? Um, you know, exploring the underlying causes of physical conditions is, is a massively important thing. I get off topic a little bit, but I'm saying it's one of the main reasons people work with me to answer yeah. your question. Yeah. Another thing is they're not feeling how they want to feel. They're feeling stressed or anxious or um, I don't want to say depressed because I don't really specialize in depression, but they just don't feel happy. Let's put it that way. They want to be, feel more fulfilled. Um, and they want to be able to, to, you know, master their emotions, not feel a victim to them. Um, and I'm out there saying, look, you don't have to control your emotions in order to master them. You have to have a healthy relationship with your emotions. Um, and so again, in a similar way I was talking earlier about peace with thoughts, a lot of my work is about peace with emotions as well. And um, people want my one-to-one -one guidance on helping them to really master that in their life. Because it's so important to, to master your emotions. Yeah. Um, otherwise, they run the show. And if it's not like a health condition or some sort of emotional thing, then it's usually some sort of life circumstantial thing, some sort of life event, whether they're, you know, often there are on the brink of divorce or they're struggling to make more money or, you know, the kind of classic things. But, you know, let's face it, my coaching services aren't free. So people have to be motivated to want to work with me. So I tend to work with people that have something going on <laughs> that they want to resolve. Um, yes. Yeah. You know, um, insomnia or anxiety, very common things that people are showing up with, as, as I'm sure you're very well aware of with the work you do. Yes, definitely, definitely. And um, we were talking about this before we started recording, but I came and saw you speak um, at an event maybe about four years ago at a Hay House event. I think it's called Ignite. And you were talking about, and it really stuck with me. And I've had conversations about it with people like over the years, because it really like, made an impression on me about how if we have a physical you know, problem, think about how it makes you feel. And actually that feeling is what you need to work on. And maybe I've misinterpreted it or not explained it very well, but I remember I was struggling with like an autoimmune type issue and I felt really out of control. And I, you know, in my life, that's a pattern of um, wanting to be in control of things and not wanting to be out of control. So that was just an interesting insight about how things can kind of be mirrored um, in our physical bodies and in our kind of emotional states as well. Well, let me talk about that briefly, if it's all right, just a bit more yeah. detail on that. Because what I observed, and, and there's different things with the mind detox, it's a, it's a, a, a process where you answer certain questions, it helps you to get to the root cause event, which then helps you to get to the root cause reason as to why this thing might be happening. Um, I've got the calm cure technique as well, which is slightly different. I think that's what I was talking about at the event you're talking about, because okay. the calm cure is, is, is talking about, you know, anytime we have a problem, there's, there's three parts at play, but most of the time we're only aware of the first two. Um, we usually have some sort of physical symptoms happening. For you to know there might have been an autoimmune thing going on, there must have been some sort of physical flag, uh, some sort of symptom. And then we turn to then go to a doctor or whatever and get a diagnosis, and that then becomes a name. So we've got the name and we've got the symptoms. But most people don't recognize the third element, which is so fundamentally important, because most people kind of get the name of the symptoms. They think they know why they're sick now. Oh, I'm sick because I have arthritis. I sit, I'm ill because I have an autoimmune disease. So it sounds like they're getting told the cause. Even then, when they're getting told you know, by the doctor, oh, you have the stomach problem because you have IBS. So it sounds very much like you're being told the cause, but you're not. Nine times out of 10 or more, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, all we're really getting is a label for the collection of physical symptoms that we're presenting. 
that's basically what a large part of what doctors are, you know, when, especially when it comes to like, diagnosing what's going on for someone, so they can then prescribe either a drug or a, a operation or some sort of lifestyle advice or whatever. But they'll, th their training is mainly this collection of symptoms is called this, and this is what you do about it. This is a collection of symptoms is called this. Well, if you're wanting to recognize that I have a mind, I have emotions, I have a spiritual side, I have a lifestyle, I have a life, and I have a body, and all of these things are coming together to create my reality, whether it's my physical reality, my emotional reality, my mental reality, my spiritual reality, or my life reality, then we, we have to stop being so narrow when it comes to just physical conditions of physical symptoms. We need to go beyond that. And that's what I was talking about at that talk, where you kind of go, well, okay, I've got the name, I've got the symptoms, but how does it feel to be living with these symptoms? That's kind of the simple starter question for anyone wanting to explore this. How does it feel really annoying? Yeah, yeah, get beyond the annoying, frustrating. Yeah, get beyond the frustration. How does it feel to be living with the chronic pain? Oh, like I'm under attack, I can't get away. How does it feel to be living with, living with the rash? Oh, like irritating, like something's under my skin. How do I feel like blah, blah, blah? And you get to things like you said, control or, or whatever. I can't control this. This is happening to me or, or whatever. The way you describe a physical condition is quite magical in, ref in being symbolic into actually giving you a very targeted way of finding out what the mental and emotional spiritual cause might be. Um, because you'll see that third element of how it feels is pointing in the direction of the next obvious question. If I'm feeling irritated, like something's under my skin, where in my life have I been feeling that way? You know, if I feel under attack, can't get away from the pain, where in my life have I been feeling that way? And when you start asking these questions, it's like, OMG, I can see that I was actually feeling that way before the physical symptoms occurred. And what I've observed is that, yes, most of the time, you're, you're having an emotional life issue before it turns physical. We've had the, we've had the, 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 the hints or the clues uh, through the emotions or the stress. If we don't listen to these clues, then it ends up, it can end up physical. I think it's fascinating, really fascinating. Um, I know that you've, in your book, um, Mind Detox, you talk about finding the root cause reason for things. And yeah. I think often, if we're talking about anxiety specifically, often people I speak to will tell me they don't know why they're anxious or they have been told by the doctor that it's um, like a chemical imbalance in their brain or something like that. And well, that's a symptom again, often. Okay, yeah. So, so talk about. Can you talk about the why it's important to get to the root cause reason? Well, as long as we're treating symptoms, we're just kind of we're treating symptoms. Um, we're we're maybe managing something, but we're not actually resolving it fully. Um, the, the the source of it, the cause of it, the, the potential of it still exists. Uh, so the, why would you want to resolve the cause is, well, you can finally move on free from it. Um, I had chronic anxiety. Now I don't. Um, I got to the root cause of it. Um, the, the thing about getting to the cause is often we don't know why we're feeling what we're feeling. We're just feeling it. And that's, that's where it gets really confusing. You know, and also it can become quite self-violent because you kind of think, well, I must be doing this anxiety to myself somehow. You know, and of course we're not. No one wakes up in the morning wanting to feel anxious. No one wakes up necessarily wanting to have, you know, be paralyzed by the, the fear of going out or meeting someone or, or whatever. We want to be free. And so um, getting to the root cause is, is about getting to the root cause event in our life that potentially created the root cause uh, toxic belief that's causing us to unconsciously filter our reality and be justified to feel how we're feeling. So any emotion we're having, we feel justified. At some level, our mind believes it's justified to feel that emotion as opposed to some other emotion. There's some sort of justification in there. And so we need to get to re what is this underlying justification for the body to create these emotions and, and how can we give, make it justified to feel something different instead, something more pleasant, uh, something less uh, limiting. So for example, Let's say someone came to me with anxiety and, and we ask the first question of the mind detox and uh, they get an age. 
They don't know where the ages come from. They just say three years old. Okay, three years old. When you think of that time, what's the first person, place, event, or thing that comes to mind? I'd ask. And they go, well, I, I remember being at the park. Okay, so you're at the park, age three. Well, you know, what was happening? And they're like, oh, my God, that was a dog running towards me with his teeth out. I was very scared. So that's the event. A dog running towards you park, you know, barking or whatever. The root cause reasons. Well, what, what is it about that that was a problem for you? Well, I felt scared. And what was it about it that made you feel that way? I was scared I was going to die. And so that day, without realizing, for example, it's a simple example, but they just they, they came to the conclusion, they formed the belief they were going to die. Now, from that moment on, without realizing, unconsciously, they've been filtering the reality, finding perceived threats to their mere existence, their, their, their actual existence. Their, their mind is on a state of high alert because it believes it's going to die. And so we end up with anxiety later on in life, not knowing why. Does that, does that make any sense? Yeah, maybe? totally, totally. Yeah, and so that's how, you know, we don't, we've all had events happen to us from a very young age. We've been forming beliefs uh, since the, before we were born, literally, uh, in the womb. And, and, uh, and these beliefs are, 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 are justifying how we feel in any given moment. So in the context of anxiety, um, we... If you have anxiety, there's a high chance of some sort of what I call a toxic uh, belief uh, that you want to mind detox. Okay, so what would the, so would a, um, an example of a toxic belief be like I'm gonna I'm gonna die or something or um, yeah, like I've got the top twenty be? in the back of the book actually. Um, there's like I I'm uh, let me actually have a look at them uh, while until I get the Caesars. Um, I'm unloved. I'm unwanted, I'm rejected, I'm on my own, I'm abandoned, um, there's nobody there for me, uh, there's something wrong with me, I'm not good enough, um, I'm let down by others, um, I'm lost or kind of there's a, a sense of loss, uh, I'm unprotected, unsafe, weak, vulnerable, I can't stop bad things happening. There's a number of like common toxic beliefs. These are beliefs that they just, we, we can form them very easily with, and very innocently. And I, often, they're not based on reality because we're forming our beliefs at a very young age when we've got very little limited life experience. And what then ends up happening is because the mind tends to want to prove itself right, the minute it forms a belief, it just starts proving that belief right over and over and over again until you have some sort of intervention like Mindy Docs or whatever um, that can actually change that belief uh, for the better. I think it's so interesting. I'm just thinking about in my life, I, on the, in the work that I've done to kind of explore this, um, I was like left to cry as a baby because my mom just couldn't cope. She needed to sleep, which is understandable from her perspective. But I think I took on board this belief that I'm not lovable, that I, you know, I'm going to be abandoned. And that I think was a massive like, reason for my anxiety um, over the years. Um, so exactly. I mean, it puts in the back foot that does. It, it, you're constantly needing to find love on the outside. Um, and therefore, you never want to love you. And, and, and any sign of someone not can, you end up with an inappropriate level of emotional response to what happens. So someone writes a bad review on Amazon or whatever, and it's like, oh my God, you know, a punch in the stomach. Because these sorts of beliefs can lead us to like needing everyone to love us. And that's, a, that's, that's impossible because everyone's got their own beliefs, filters, preferences, opinions. You're never, you know, there's always going to be someone that doesn't like us. We, we need to get to a place of, of being at peace with some people liking us and some people not. Some people getting us and some people not. I'm just, it's just for example. Yeah, yeah. When you're doing mind detox, you know, once you get the root cause reason, then, then you want to resolve it. And so in the case of the scared I'm going to die, well, the simple antidote learning for that would be, I survived. And it's a blind spot. We often just take it for granted, but we survived. In fact, if, if you listen to this, you survived every single scary, bad event that's ever happened to you up until this point. Well done. But we often don't take that. We don't really recognize that. We don't recognize how resourceful we are, how, how flexible we are, how we've managed to survive every single thing that's come our way this far. We often focus on the worst moments and then get feel vulnerable from them as opposed to recognize our resilience from the fact I've made it this far. 
you know, when you start to recognize these home truths, they start to immediately form new beliefs. And therefore you start naturally feeling differently. Um, so yeah, what I would say is when it comes to anxiety, one part of the process it would be to heal uh, your unhealthy beliefs. There, there's other parts if you want to talk about it at some point but, uh, with me, but uh, that's a core part. Yeah, okay. That's very reassuring to remember that we have survived every challenge that we've come across and we do have a lot more resources than we give ourselves credit for. Um, can, you, can you tell us anything else about um, what else you would recommend for people with anxiety? Yeah, I would. I have something I'd love to share with them, but it's, 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 um, they need to be open-minded to what I'm about to say. Um, because it was something that really helped me on my journey with, with, with anxiety. Um, nobody ever taught me to actually have a healthy relationship with my emotions. No, nobody really taught me growing up how to calmly coexist with intense energy in my body. And so I learned that there were emotions, that I, ways I should feel and ways I shouldn't feel. And anytime the shouldn't feel emotions appeared up, which, which was right, rose up, um, sorry, it would be immediately wanting to resist them, wanting to push them away. And that resistance created a pressure that would just build up, build up, build up until eventually the volcano, a uh, panic attack or, you know, overwhelm or just so much emotions um, that I... I didn't know how to live with them anymore. And so I'm an advocate of, yes, exploring the root cause, reason why you're feeling this way, but more importantly, even to that, would be to be actively cultivating a healthy relationship with, your, with, with your, the full spectrum of emotions. Ultimately, to do that, I, I spent a whole two hours in, my, in a masterclass online recently talking about this, so I'm going to try and squeeze some things into into a couple of minutes but um energy we need energy to be alive we need energy to do stuff to create stuff to uh, make stuff happen to achieve our goals or or to, to heal the body or whatever often the energy that the inner intelligence needs and is is is, is allowing to rise up we are immediately shut, shutting down uh, we're pushing down because we're not willing to experience it. That in, by suppressing emotions, we're often suppressing our healing ability. By suppressing emotions, we're often healing, uh, suppressing our creative uh, power, the ability to actually create what we want. It's almost like this inner intelligence knows what kind of level of energy intensity we need in order to either heal something, which we might not even know we need to heal. The mind, the body knows what it needs to do or to create something that we say we want in our lives. So we say, well, I want to make more money, or I want to meet someone, or I want to go out and do this. The energy rises up, and we interpret that as fear or anxiety, when actually it can be very, the very energy rising up to help us to, to create the thing that we th say that we want. Do you see what I'm trying to say with this? Yeah, yeah. So, for example, let's imagine a beautiful Orient Express. You've got the Orient Express train going along its tracks, and then it's like a movie. You kind of pan along the side, and you go into the, you go uh, into the, the dining car. There's people there with their plates and their cutlery and their, you know, crystal glasses, and there's a piano playing in the corner, and you know, waiters with their white cloth over, and it's all very nice. And everyone's tucking into their dinner. Beautiful, beautiful meal, beautiful restaurant. And then you pan out of, of that cart, you go along to the front where you're into the engine now, and you've got two or three people um, covered in suit, uh, sweating, and, and then someone opens up this latch and there's like this furnace, and, and they're chuckling the coal in, and it's like really intense, really intense. Now, without that intensity, this is not the Orient Express. Without that intensity, that energy, that Orient Express can't perform the function for which it was built. It can't live the purpose for which it was born. It can be a restaurant, but it wouldn't be the Orient Express gliding through the valleys uh, while people have the dinner or whatever. What I'm trying to say is I discovered that I needed the energy that I kept calling anxiety. It was my own personal powerhouse. It was my inner fire. And when I stopped suppressing it, I became super creative. I became super energized. 
not manic, just energized, it's good energy. Um, and I was actually able to, you know, create like being on TV in 30 countries, getting amazing publishers for, for my books, um, uh, creating academies, uh, talking on stage in front of thousands. And, and that's from a person who has dyslexia, so I can't write, is scared of, scared of public speaking. You know, all these things that were, you know, that energy would previously stop me, I actually used it to be able to do the very thing. But it's because I had an unhealthy relationship with the energy. It wasn't there to stop me. It was there to empower me. And so I know it can be a big leap for someone if they're experiencing anxiety for me to go, oh, just feel your feelings. Just let your, don't, don't resist it. I totally hear you. And that's why for me, it's so important to be doing some sort of meditation alongside this and things that can actually help you to um, wake up to the context of the movement of the mind, the context of the movement of emotions, this inner presence of being that we all are. That gives you a, a more stable anchor um, to, to feel secure with as you start to play with changing your relationship with your emotions. Um, so I don't know if that's useful, Chloe. Um, Absolutely. But. Yeah, I think that's a really life changing idea. And I hope people can really take that on board, actually, because it just reframes something that so often we run away from or we try to uh, suppress or numb ourselves or make ourselves wrong for feeling it. We have shame about that anxiety, that energy. And actually, it's um, if we can, you know, use it and go with it and it can be our creative power and you know, I have a little phrase that I get people to say. I said, they turn to the emotion and say, hello, emotion. Thanks for passing by. You're welcome to hang out as long as you want. Very simple. Yeah. But hello, emotion gets you more into the observer again. Because emotions, whether you, whether you believe it or not, are temporary. There's been a time in your life when this emotion wasn't present. So it's not who you are. It's a temporary transient visitor passing through. It might be a pretty regular visitor, but it's temporary. Okay, so hello emotion gets you into the observer. Thanks for passing by. It reminds you that this is a temporary thing. Now, when you're in a panic attack or in sadness or whatever, it can feel like, I felt this forever. I'll never feel different again. But we know if we can just remind ourselves, this is a temporary thing. So hello emotions, thanks for passing through. And here's the key thing. You're welcome to hang out as long as you want. Now, you can't say that really wanting it to go away you've actually got to step up to the plate know you want to heal your relationship with this energy and your emotions in general and you're generally going to breathe into it and say yeah do your work be here as long as you want stop i.e you're not going to resist it because what you resist persists so as long as you're in conflict with it it's going to continue okay so you're welcome to hang out as long as you want it if you genuinely mean that and then you just get on with your day not trying to make the emotion go away, but you hang out as you want and get on with your day, you'll soon find the emotions aren't there anymore. Our, our focus on it fuels it, our resistance to it keeps it stuck. And that simple philosophy behind these, that statement, you know, hello emotions, thanks for passing by, you're welcome to hang out as long as you want. Now here's the thing when it comes to feeling emotions, most people get confused about. Yeah, we've all heard feel your feelings, but here's the thing. Most people, don't know how, most people don't know how to feel their feelings and remain self-aware at the same time. You've got to yeah, feel your feelings, but you got, don't lose yourself in your feelings. See, when people fully identify with their feelings, they become the emotion. I am anxious, and they've become it, that temporary thing. They've lost their sense of self. They've become you know, the emotion, which isn't who they are. It's a temporary thing. So what we're really wanting to do, and this is why I said earlier with meditation, is get to know who you really are, the permanent, unchanging aspect of yourself. Get to know that, the still, silent uh, presence of being, which is the context of everything, that all movement of mind and emotions and body and life, this context. So what I say to people is, look, don't, yeah, feel your feelings, but do it whilst remaining present, whilst remaining self-aware. Um, and there's obviously in my books I talk about how to do that um, uh, and courses and things. But, you know, hopefully that makes sense. I, I want to make sure that's in there so someone doesn't leave here thinking, it, oh, it's just feel your feelings. It's like, no, it's, it's wake up to who you really are beyond the feelings. 
And in doing so, you naturally hear relationship with the feelings. And along the way of waking up to your real self, um, you can play with these exercises like hello emotions, thanks for passing by, to start to, to kind of shift your relationship uh, with with all energy. Yes, yes. So, so that statement that you said about what we resist persists, uh, it's kind of a bit of a paradox that if we just allow ourselves to feel whatever we're feeling, actually the feeling gets kind of processed and doesn't hang around forever. Um, but I think what you've said is really important that having maybe a meditation practice or something is going to help you to be more grounded whilst you're feeling those emotions, help you to be present with yourself while you're feeling them rather than, than taking I read some amazing research which said that the, the lifespan of an emotion is about 90 seconds. Now that's pretty incredible research because, so what it's basically saying is from the moment like there's a mental trigger which releases the neuropeptides, the molecules of emotion, which you know many people might have heard of now, the molecules of the emotion is in, into the bloodstream. It takes about 90 seconds for these molecules to kind of just dissolve back into the hole again. If that makes, you know what I mean? It's kind yeah. of there and then it kind of goes back into the system and dissolves back into and becomes something else eventually. Um, that means like left to its own, without our interference in some way, most, energy, most emotions pass, come by really quick. See, these days, my, my, my relationship with my emotions is to a point where, well, first, honestly, I don't care how I feel anymore. And, and I mean that in the best possible way. Um, because as a monk and a meditation teacher, I've really explored the permanent aspect of myself and learning to be fully present, fully, fully present in reality. Not in my mind thinking about stuff in the past and future or whatever, just fully here. Now, when I'm fully here, I saw that I had to leave the moment to check in on how I'm feeling. I'd have to say, oh, how am I feeling? Oh, I'm feeling this. You know, what am I feeling? How am I feeling? Why am I feeling this way? And all that was in a mental process. So I genuinely mean it when I said I don't care <laughs> because I'm too busy being present to actually want to leave the moment uh, to, to check in. If someone did say, you know, how are you feeling? I'd say, I don't know. I don't care, but I'm absolutely alive and enjoying life. None of the problem I'm saying is numb. I, I feel more emotions than ever. But what I find happens is I'm just now find I, I experience the the emotion that's relevant and appropriate for the moment. Whatever the moment, whatever's happening in the moment determines what emotion I feel. Does that make sense? Now, the more present you become, you see the moment is con there's also is all brand new. There's something else that's being presented. And if you stay present, you tend to find emotions just come and go. Very much like children. You've seen a child and they're upset about something. And then a second later, they have an emotion for the new thing. Like, oh, what's that toy? Or, oh, that, you know, their emotions can change super quick. They're not holding on or thinking, dwelling, you know, fueling emotions. Does it make any sense whatsoever? Totally. Yeah, yeah we, it's definitely something to aim for. <laughs> Definitely something to aim for, not caring how you, what you're feeling, in a sense. Yeah, but in a I good don't, way. <laughs> if you're trying to do that conceptually from the mind, then you end up almost depressed because you're trying to do it conceptually. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I don't care. You know, kind of sting at yourself. If you're just so present, you don't check out to go into the energy, you know, check in on the emotion or start labeling the emotion or having stories about why am I feeling this way? How do I make the thing go away? If you don't engage any of that, you'll find emotions come and go. Uh, super quick you feel fully you're fully alive but um, you have more uh, range of emotions on a daily basis so if you're stuck in a one emotional cycle whether it be depression or anxiety or m melancholy or whatever it might be um, it's very useful to know that it's not happening to you that there is something you are doing in there that is fueling the fire uh, and it includes your focus and resistance often the stories you're telling yourself the the, the stuff you're focusing on because the, what you think about you start feeling about yeah and you start yeah. feeling your thinking um and so that's why i keep saying you know change relationship with your mind mind through meditation and also explore what the root cause might be as well that's so powerful thank you so much for sharing that mm -hmm. um i could listen to you speak forever but i think i need to um I think that's a bit of exaggeration, but I take the compliment. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you tell us where people can find out more about you and what you do? Well, that's very kind of you. Um, I, you know, 
what I'm most passionate about right now is, is bringing about a more peaceful planet. I think that, you know, if we want to live in a calm and conscious world, we need to be calm and conscious people. And so what I'm really putting a lot of my focus on right now is my calm Academy where I'm teaching meditation teachers or mind practitioners practitioners or full on calmologists and all my techniques because people not only benefit massively themselves genuinely through the process, um, but they end up at the end being able to share these techniques and skills with other people if they want to, and they can, they're all fully insurable and, accredited courses so they can earn from what they learn if they want to and things but it's so i'd love them to check out my calmacademy.com calmacademy.com that'd be really cool um, if they want to just purely learn for personal use i have an online membership website called the calm clan uh, where we have monthly meditation classes and master classes and weekly meditation gatherings all live on online it's an amazing unique service to have so much live uh, support and community um, I mean, people members from all around the world that uh, take part in that. Um, that's found at my website, sandynewbeginning.com. And I've got books out and one-to-one -one mentoring if, if you want that as well. But I don't want to step on your toes because you do great work as well. But it's very kind of you to let me uh, advertise no problem. your platform. There's plenty of um, <laughs> uh, anxious people in the world for both of us. <laughs> um, I, I want people to know that that anxiety... Um, whether they like it or not, or they might want to shoot me right now by saying so, it, it can be your route to liberation and empowerment. It, it, it could just be a, a shift in perception and a shift in relationship with it. And it can actually be used as a powerful force for good. And let me just end on one little thing here, because um, I kick myself if I didn't share this. And again, you've got to be open minded to hear this. But the more I've meditated, the more I've gone beyond mental constructs and, and individual labels for things, um, the more I've explored that the emotions that I used to call fear and anxiety, believe it or not, are joy. But no one ever told me that. It doesn't work. You know, in the world we live in right now, people would say, don't worry, that's just joy. But if you look at the ancient texts and what the spiritual teachers have all been saying, always been saying is, They've been saying we're kind of this beautiful combination of peace, love, and joy. Peace is kind of like the stable. Love, love is like the glue. And then joy is like the creative force. If you look at the Holy Trinity in the past or the Holy Spirit and Father, Son, Holy Spirit stuff, then the Holy Spirit is the movement of life, the movement of God. Um, joy. Now, I might undermine and lose lots of people by saying this, but what I've found is that when I, let, when I went beyond all these labels and the conditioning and all the stuff I've been led to believe, I actually found that this, this energy that I was previously resisting and thinking it was anxiety was actually this inner joy, this movement of life, this creative force that, that was in me and it was a good thing that it was there. It made me human and, and by joy, I don't mean happy. I mean like the movement of life aliveness intense mm. aliveness but because we're not taught that it's that we often suppress our own aliveness so although it might not all make sense i just hopefully some seeds have been planted yeah. and um through this yeah. conversation and i've been looking forward to talking to you for so long chloe because i love what you're doing in the world of anxiety and calm it's amazing work you're so relatable and real and honest and uh, that's why i follow you and follow your work and uh, so it's been a real privilege to to have this chat with you today. Thank you so much for this conversation. I think people are going to benefit so, so much from it. Yeah. So thanks so much for taking the time. Our pleasure.